In this section, we're going to use what we've discovered about sets and combinatorics to investigate a new topic, probability. You might have seen probability when you were in matric, but if it's new, that's absolutely fine. We're going to be starting right from the basics. So what is probability? Well, broadly speaking, probability gives us a way of measuring how likely it is that something will occur. And we're going to talk a little bit about more the, f the formal language that we use, but broadly speaking, this is what we're talking about. Slightly more specifically, we are going to assign a number between 0 and 1 to any event which may or may not happen, where 0 means that the event simply cannot happen, and 1 means that it absolutely can. And anything in between gives us an estimate of how likely it is that it will happen. The higher the number is, so the closer to 1, the more likely it is to happen, whereas the closer to 0, the less likely it is to happen but we're going to firm up these ideas as we go along. Because just as with sets and combinatorics, we had to develop uh, the useful language to speak about probability. Uh, we, because just as with sets and combinatorics, we needed to develop good language to talk about the concepts, we need to do the same thing for probability. So one of the things that comes up quite often in probability is that we're going to conduct experiments, even though they might just be experiments that we do in our head. And when we're talking about doing experiments, we have some terms and notation that are useful. So the first thing is when we're conducting our experiment, we think about all the possible outcomes that that experiment might have, and we call that set of things the sample space of the experiment or the outcome space. But really, in terms of the set theory that we've already been doing, this is our universal set. It's the set of all possible things that we could be working with. But the thing that you'll notice, particularly if you do more statistics, is this set is labeled big S. But if you label it big U because that's what you're used to, that's also fine. So now we want to be a little more specific. We're talking about random experiments. What is a random experiment? It's anything that we can repeat where we can specify what all the possible outcomes are, but we don't know exactly which one is going to happen. For example, if you flip a coin, you know that it can either land heads or tails, but you don't know until you've actually flipped it which of those two things is actually going to happen. That's a random experiment. The next idea is the idea of a trial. So if we have this concept of a random experiment, Actually doing the experiment one time and measuring the result is called a trial. So if I flip a coin once, that's a trial. And then the final thing that we're going to look at here is sometimes it's going to be useful to talk about collections of outcomes. So remember our universal set or our sample space of the experiment was the set of all possible outcomes. And sometimes we want to look at a subset of that. And we call that an event. And just as with general subsets, we usually label with a capital A, B, C, and so on. Now, one of the things that you'll notice is that statisticians often talk about success and failure. But what's important here is that this isn't really a qualitative judgment. What they're saying is that if you're recording the result of a trial, a success for event A means that the particular outcome lies in the subset A. If it doesn't, then the, then the trial was a failure. But there's no judgment here. It's just saying, oh, uh, the thing I was measuring came up, or oh, the thing I was measuring didn't come up. Another useful concept is the idea of mutually exclusive events. Now remember, an event is a subset of our universal set, or our set of possible outcomes. Mutually exclusive events are disjoint events or disjoint subsets. They don't have any outcomes in common. For example, a very simple case, flipping a coin, you either get heads or tails. You can't get both if you're just flipping the coin once. So these two events, the event getting heads or getting tails, um, these are mutually exclusive. Now, often, we're going to conduct an experiment multiple times. So we'll have multiple trials. Uh, we usually say we have 
n trials. So we're going to measure the result of our experiment a bunch of times and we're going to say that the frequency of the thing we're measuring that comes up as a success is the cardinality of the set A. But a more useful measurement is that of relative frequency, where you take the total number of trials, which is n, and you're going to divide the number of times that you get the success for event A by the number of n, by the number of trials. And finally, if you're wanting to represent your data, often we'll use a histogram. So you've seen bar charts before, and we'll see them coming up. So this was a whole bunch of terminology. It only really makes sense once you start thinking about actual probability experiments. So let's do that. So the most basic experiment that we can try is flipping a fair coin repeatedly. So here we're thinking about the sample space. And remember, that's the possible outcomes of our experiment. Well, our possible outcomes are either the coin comes up heads or the coin comes up tails. And our random experiment is flipping a coin and measuring if it's heads or tails. And if we think about the possible outcomes, heads and tails, well, as we said, they can't both happen after a single flip, so these must be mutually exclusive. And in set theoretic terms, we're thinking of these as disjoint. Now, you could sit and flip a coin a bunch of times and measure what you found, but actually it's useful to use a computer. So we're going to let Sage simulate our experiment for us. And when it does this, we're going to think about what happens as the number of flips, so that's the number of trials, goes up. And we're also going to think about, do we expect that we'll always get the same number of heads and tails, or not? And if not, why not? So let's head over and let Sage do this. So you can actually do this yourself. So if we go to Evaluate Sage, And in this particular case, we've had five flips, which you can see at the top of the, the green box. And it turns out that in our five flips, we got three tails and two heads. And Sage also measures for us the relative frequencies. So out, so we had five total flips and our relative frequency for the outcome tails was three fifths and our relative frequency for the outcome heads was two fifths. So take a moment to think about what will happen if we increase the number of flips in our experiment overall. What's going to happen to our relative frequencies? Well, let's have a look and see. So I've increased the number of flips to 4,539. And let's have a look. Our frequency of tails is 2,307. Heads is 2,232, and we can also look at the relative frequencies, but if you look at the histogram, you'll see that our relative frequencies look a lot closer together. So it seems like, even though we don't always get exactly the same number of heads and tails, because this is just a random experiment, as we increase our number of flips, the number of heads and tails gets closer and closer together. Let's look at another example. So here we're thinking about rolling a fair six-sided die. Take a moment and write down the sample space and the random experiment and think about what you expect the relative frequencies of the possible outcomes to be. So our sample space is the set of possible outcomes. And if you roll a fair six-sided dice, sorry, die, if you roll a fair six-sided die, then your possible outcomes are one, 
two, three, four, five, six. And our random experiment is rolling one die and measuring the face that comes up. So we're going to see an alternative um, dice experiment a little bit later. And if we think about the relative frequencies, so here we're thinking, what do we think that each of our outcomes, if we do the experiment n times, of those n times, how many times will we get a 1? And if it's a fair dice, well, we, we think that they should be about the same. So we think that we should get about 1 sixth as a relative frequency for 1, 1 sixth as a relative frequency for 2, and so on. So this is what we, we think. And again, we can, let's say, simulate the experiment for us. So this experiment is a little bit lower. And if we say evaluate, so here we've got 20 rolls. And notice here, this experiment starts with a four-sided dice. I'm going to flip it over to a six-sided dice. And then we can see, well, we don't have quite equally likely relative frequencies, but they're not far off. And again, if we increase our number of trials to over 4,000, now notice that our relative frequencies are becoming much similar, much more similar. And they're in fact becoming quite close to one sixth. And you can imagine that if you increase the number of rolls even further, you'd get even better accuracy. So one more experiment to think about, and this is to help us think about the difference between doing the experiment and what we're measuring. So we're considering rolling two dice and measuring their sum. So we're just going to measure their sum. And if we think about what the sample space is, well, our sample space is all the possible outcomes of summing the values on two dice. So we can't actually get a one because each of the die has to show something, and the lowest they can each show is one. So the lowest thing we could get is a two. Um, we can certainly get a three and a four, and in fact, everything up to 10, 11, and 12 is the highest we can go when both die have a six. What's our random experiment? Here, our random experiment is rolling two dice and measuring their sum. So now take a moment to think about what we expect the relative frequencies of the possible outcomes to be. And one way to think about this is thinking all the different ways that you can get the different sums. So for example, the only way that you can get a sum of two is if both of the dice show a one. And similarly, the only way you can get a 12 is if they both show a 6. On the other hand, if you consider something like 4, there are different ways in which the faces of the die can combine, dice can combine to give you a sum of 4. For example, you might have one that shows a 1 and one that shows a 3, or they both show 2. So there are more options for the ways in which you can get 4. So you might expect that the relative frequency of 4 is higher than 2 or 12. And again, we can let Sage simulate the experiment for us. Let's see what it does. So here we go, we're going to evaluate. And isn't that interesting? So our relative frequency of 1 and 2, and also 11 and 12, is quite low, but for 5 and 6, our relative frequencies are quite high. And again, let's see what happens if we increase our number of rolls. Took a little while, but there, that's a pretty picture. So that shows us that if we are looking for a six, it's much more likely to happen than if we're looking 
So a sum of 6, it's much more likely to happen than getting a sum of 2 or a sum of 12. So our intuition was correct. So this was just an introduction and a way of linking. Next time we're going to be talking about probability itself and how that relates to, to relative frequency.